Beatles, White Album. The real title is just The Beatles. This is my dad's vinyl copy, which is a 70s copy, so it's not one of the original ones that has the numbers. Though I've seen a few, I've never been tempted to actually buy it. My whole childhood was just listening to The Beatles and like really reading books about The Beatles. Like I would read about all these songs and, and, and who recorded them, like who was playing which instruments, because some of these songs it's only Paul playing drums, you know, it's not Gringo, etc. You will not find a better compilation of Beatles songs. It's like if you put a best off of the Beatles, you'll have, you know, your, I Wanna Hold Your Hands, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, Strawberry Fields, but you will not, you will not get the essence of what the Beatles are. Like what, what really are these dudes thinking about music? Like Sgt. Pepper's is, is the Beatles with George Martin, you know, with J Jeff Emmerich. They were trying to do something that they couldn't do them themselves with, you know, Sgt. Pepper, with Magical Mystery Tour, but the White Album is now them going back and saying like, this is, this is the music we do. This is the music we actually play. Maybe now it doesn't seem like that much of a deal, but to go from Sgt. Pepper, Magical Mystery Tour to this, it's in, in some ways, you know, cutting your instruments from a hundred to you know, five. You have the same intensity in songs that are so pared down with just four people playing. They're just as powerful as the Day in the Life, which has them playing plus a 40 something piece orchestra, you know. I could go song by song here, Glass Onion. So it's just like John Lennon really going back and saying like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm the one who controls the blues. It's not the Stones, it's not the Who, it's, it's us. And in fact, you could say that the White Album is a response to the Stones, to the Who, to the Kinks, to all these bands. But here they really just want to tell all the bands like, okay, you think you know what we're going for? Like, you have no idea. Revolution 9 may be the most famous experimental song of all time. You could argue that that song created the American and British having garden music, you know, and it not, maybe not created, but like it, it pushed it to a more mainstream area, an area where people could actually think that they could not only make that music, but could enjoy it. Anyone that has a mark, like a dot, is one of his, is his favorite songs, so I can actually tell you the ones that don't have a mark, which is easier. Revolution 9, Honey Pie, Savoy Truffle, Why Don't We Do It In The Road, so my dad doesn't like Why Don't We Do It In The Road, Wild Honey Pie, yeah, no, Wild Honey Pie might be the weakest song actually in this record. This is exactly the moment when the Beatles fractured. Like there's everything before this, as much as Paul or John or whoever was controlling the song or the album, they were still a unit. They would still respond to each other and, and actually create songs together. But at this point is when they could actually afford a studio basically for each member. So Paul had his studio where he would record a few songs. So in Abbey Road, which at that time was EMI Studios, they would have EMI studio number one and two, and then Paul would do a song in two while John was doing something in number one and etc. So when Paul started bringing songs like Obla Dee Blah Dah, you know, uh, Wild Honey Pie, Rocky Raccoon, like John Lennon just started calling it granny music. I think that's more of a response to after they broke up and all these interviews came out and John Lennon had to justify his position in the Beatles and what he did. Like, I think it was easier for him to, at that point to say, oh, it's granny music, because at that point it was established that a lot of people thought that, you know, Lennon was the harsh one and McCartney was the pop one. So, you know, it's unfair maybe, but I, I, I just don't think it's smart to be against a specific music because of how, you know, the tone is, you know, because granny music basically means, you know, it's pop music for old ladies. I feel like just John Lennon was more responding in those interviews to his hurt feelings after the fact. In the end, this this granny music creates Blackbird. You know, this granny music cre creates something like Good Night, which Ringo sings, but both of them wrote. So it's, in my opinion, I'll say the good is much better than the bad. So I'll take it. Stop right there. Oh, I know which one this is, just because of the shape. Ugh. So this is Talking Heads speaking in tongues and it will be really hard for people to see it, I guess, because this is a special vinyl edition. 
I uh, really specifically wanted to get this version on vinyl because I just like it. <laughs> it's just such a strange case. The vinyl itself is like a clear vinyl. We have these like color, red, green, and yellow. If you put them together, it gives you more of a color grid, but it's just a really, like I've, I've actually tried to do it myself and it's actually really hard. So for me to try to do it for you, you guys in the video, it's gonna be impossible. But you can see they're speaking in tongues. This is the first Talking Heads without Eno. It's a really good record actually. And it, and it proves that, you know, Talking Heads didn't need Eno. Not that that was ever in question because the first record is great. This is the moment when I, I feel like Talking Heads decided to be less of this art nerd band and, and, and try to hit the mainstream. And, and I don't know if it's because of the, you know, some of the songs, I don't know if Naive Melody, This Must Be The Place, which is one of the bigger songs in this record, was the reason. I mean, they had Take Me To The River before, which is a cover. This is clearly the time when Talking Heads realized that they were just not this indie New York CBGB's band. I mean, and not, and not that it, they didn't realize that before, but I think that Eno was controlling their psyche in a way that they didn't understand. So anyways, by the time they started making this record, they really wanted to go more like world music, like a tribal, sound in terms of like you know drums and taking out that eno influence which was this this like the polyrhythmic guitars that starts being less of what talking heads is about this is when david byrne really takes control of the band like after this moment it's david byrne's band before it, it was a band that could just jam and create these songs out of jams because that's how remain in light was like that was just jams that became songs this was songs that he really created. So at this point, Talking Hits really becomes more of a song pop band. You, that, and that's not a bad thing, you know. But in the end, they decided really clearly to depart from the art world. And then after this, you know, they recorded a Stop Making Sense with John and Demi. So I'm pretty sure it's the tour, either Speaking in Tongues or the one after. This is top Talking Heads, so don't get me wrong. This is a great record, but this is clearly when they decided to shift their sound because this external influence was making them make music this way. It basically became the beginning of the end of Talking Heads because after this, David Byrne just took control so much that the band starts splintering and then, you know, Tom Tom Club happened, David Byrne solo, and then Talking Heads ended. Yeah.